Dr. Ryan Stanton here with ASEP Frontline, recording at ASEP 16 in Las Vegas, Nevada. Joined right now by Dr. Moira Davenport, sports medicine section here at ASEP. She is a fellowship trained emergency medicine and primary sports medicine, primary care sports medicine physician. Particular interest in the conditions common to female athletes, cardiac changes associated with frequent exercise, and of course, running related injuries and as you know there's a group here that's getting up every morning and going and doing their running um, I think it's games of chicken through the streets of through the streets of Las Vegas and we're seeing more and more people getting into these ac- active sports you know female well both sexes males females are b- becoming more active and we're actually seeing more participation in the extreme versions of sports, whether that be Absolutely. the marathons, triathlons, the extreme long distance runs. I actually, right before one of my talks today was a talk on, uh, on associated hyponatremia associated with um, long distance or extreme conditions. So this is a great topic to talk about. A lot of people are, are, are going to be interested. And as we get more and more in your communities of uh, of 5Ks and 10Ks and marathons and special events. Right now in Lexington, Kentucky, um, they are doing the Bourbon Chase, which is a 200-mile yeah. multi-relay uh, race. And so, mm-hmm. great topic. So, give me some background about you and how you got uh, particularly interested in this in this one. Sure. So, I've been a runner for longer than most of today's residents have been alive. So, I've had my share of injuries along the way. And when I was running in college, I was frequently injured and spent more time with my team physician than my coach. And that was a pretty big influence on my career. So I ended up in emergency medicine and sports medicine. And um, actually, my team physician was an orthopedic surgeon who was very gracious to let me shadow him while I was a resident since my program didn't have any sports medicine training. And he was incredibly supportive and really wanted to have more emergency physicians in sports medicine Mm -hmm. because... As he said, there are bones and there are ligaments, but there's a lot else going on, and we really need more people like you here. So that's kind of how I ended up here. How do in, how do sports-related injuries affect, or, or how should the emergency physician consider these sports? I mean, you, you've, you've, you kind of started there. You said, you know, it's much more than the bones and the ligaments. Mm-hmm. When patients come in, what are the big considerations I need to make when it comes to athletic-related injuries, and what are some of the challenges we're facing? I think one of the biggest issues to consider, and this is something that comes up quite frequently, especially now that there are so many more people participating, and especially in endurance events, is that, and I I tell our residents this all the time, is that when you have a trauma patient who comes in who's an athlete, and you can tell by looking at the patient that he or she is an athlete, pay attention to the vital signs, because my resting heart rate is in the 50s, and for me to be 90 is really tachycardic, um, and a lot of athletes have lower blood pressures as well, so when you see a, a patient who has been injured and, and the person is hypotensive, it's not necessarily a shock. So I think it's really important to consider the whole picture uh, and not just look at the, the initial injury, um, but look at the patient as a whole. Um, so I think that's something emergency physicians forget about sometimes. I think we're so used now, used to the deconditioning of America, <laughs> exactly. where we're seeing more people that have a resting heart rate of 80 or 90 mm-hmm. and blood pressures in the 150s, 60s, and 70s, right. that it is an outlier. I mean, and it, it really freaks out a lot of the staff now when you've got a patient sitting there with a heart rate in the mid to upper 40s or low right. 50s and blood pressures. You know, my wife's the same way. Her her blood pressure, if she gets 95 systolic, it's it's a it's, it's a big day. She's had too yeah. much salt. <laughs> yes. So. You know, it's a, it's a big consideration there. Mm. What are some of the other things that are changing in terms of the emergency department assessment and treatment of, of sports-related injuries? So I think another big issue that's come up a lot, and we are in the middle of football season right now, is concussions. And when these patients are coming to the emergency department, the question is, do we really need to be imaging all of these patients with with CAT scans, it is obviously a radiation exposure mm-hmm. for, in a lot of cases, high school age athletes that you don't necessarily want to put that patient through. Um, and the questions also come up, is there something we can do in the emergency department to better evaluate these patients instead of just saying, okay, well, you got hit, you have a concussion. Um, so I think we're now starting to see some emergency departments using the SCAT-3, um, which is the assessment, a sport concussion assessment tool of the third version um, that the, um, the World Cup uses, USA Soccer uses, um, minor league hockey uses. So it's, it gives you an objective piece of data that the per- patient can then take to whatever concussion clinic he or she happens to be following up at. So I think incorporating more modern or more up-to-date rather uh, concussion assessment in the emergency department, I think, is a very big aspect of care. 
Sometimes I feel like, though, that the CT scan is, you know, and when, when somebody comes in with cough and congestion, they expect that prescription for amoxicillin or azithromycin. <laughs> exactly. When a family brings in their child, their, their son with the football-related concussion or their daughter with the, the soccer or cheerleading right. or whatever it may be, I feel like that the expectation is for that right. imaging, that CT scan of the head, and it rarely pays, it, well... Not from. I don't think I've had one in years. I mean, at, since I've left the trauma center, where a child had some sort of injury in a sporting event, where there actually was a significant finding on the right. CT scan. How do we, how do we frame that conversation with the family when they come in with these expectations, considering right. our hospitals are demanding satisfaction? <laughs> It is definitely a balancing act, and I think that's one time where patient and family education really comes into play, is that I think a lot of of family members aren't aware of how much radiation is associated with a CAT scan and how much of a risk that can pose down the line. And I I think having that conversation with patients and their families, been able to avoid a lot of CAT scans. Fantastic. One of the big other things that you have interest in has been uh, the female athlete. Correct. And there are some unique challenges there. There's some unique things. So give us some idea of, of, of the differences and some things we need to consider with the female athlete. Sure. So um, one thing is particularly with the female athlete is that women tend to tear their ACLs much more frequently than men do in the same sports, but we tend to tear our ACLs from non-contact situations where we're used to watching a football game where somebody gets tackled. You can see the knee bending at a strange angle and you think, oh, that's an ACL. But with women, a lot of times it's that for so- using soccer as an example, a female soccer player will be running to catch up to get the ball, and will just plant her knee slightly differently, and can tear the ACL. But there's not another player around her. And looking at some of the biomechanical research and some of the anatomic research has been done, there are slight differences in the the diameter of the femoral notch and the. Um, And also there are differences in the way that women, when we're young girls, learn to run and to jump, actually, that are probably contributing to this. So thinking of the site biomechanical differences and the site anatomic differences between the gender really comes into play. You've already touched a little bit on the cardiovascular aspects of things. Um, And now I think one thing that we're seeing more often as well is the pregnant female, a childbearing female that is Mm -hmm. choosing to exercise through, you know, as far as pregnancy, I mean, once my wife hit 30 weeks, she was, she was ready to go out and jog more, hoping the, hoping our, yeah, our, exactly. our daughter would come out with, with that in mind, with the childbearing female, mm-hmm. I mean, the considerations there are even potentially more complex. Uh, give right. us some, cause give us some insight into that. When that patient comes strolling into the emergency department, maybe well, just say a, a, a 20 week uh, or 18 or 20 week pregnant female that is, that has fallen while out running. Sure. Um, So the basic things that we really talk about with our pregnant athletes is that, number one, hydration uh, is really important because obviously the blood volume changes in pregnancy and you want to make sure you're not shortchanging yourself and the baby at that point. We also have to talk about how to adjust their intensity as the athletes go through the pregnancy. Um, Obviously, with the increase in the blood volume, you have the slight anemia that comes along with pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So that's going to affect your oxygen carrying capacity and it's going to make a workout that you wouldn't think twice about doing beforehand seem much more challenging. Um, so we talk about that a lot. The mantra was previously exercise to fatigue, not exhaustion. And I think that's something that a lot of women can take to heart. Um, and the studies have shown that when women who do exercise throughout pregnancy actually have an easier labor and delivery. So that, I think that's a, a nice carrot for a lot of women to keep exercising while, while they're pregnant. Um, I think another thing is that we also advise women who haven't been active before pregnancy not to go into high intensity, but to work with their obstetrician to really get into a program. But when they come into the emergency department, especially after 20 weeks, you have two patients at that point. So it's really important to remember fetal monitoring and going through essentially everything you would go through for the pregnant person who was in an MVC and looking for any kinds of uh, fluid leak, any kind of bleeding, but absolutely monitoring the the fetus as well. The minor trauma, I mean, they come to the emergency department, they are very greater than 20 weeks. They are uh, usually pretty quick to clear from a trauma or injury standpoint. Right. But remembering that there still is that monitoring. Most OBs, most obstetricians will want to to observe those patients, whether in the emergency department or actually up on labor and delivery, monitor them for a, couple, uh, for a few hours or however much it right. takes to ensure there's no contractions or no activities exactly. or strain on the baby. Yeah, usually um, we have tele- telemonitoring with the, our labor and deliveries at another 
a hospital in our system, so we have telemonitoring with them, and we usually keep them at least six hours. So Let's talk extremes. This is not me by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll exercise, but the extremes, I can't do the extremes. But we're talking about uh, so many people now. It seems like the Iron Man is popping up everywhere. We've got um, triathlons popping up in multiple mm-hmm. places. Now you have these super extreme 100-mile runs and, right. and these relays and things like that. What are some of the unique challenges facing us that we may see, whether working the events or in the emergency department, when one of these events is coming in into our region? Sure. So there are a lot of different considerations with this. Um, number one is the weather conditions. They can actually play a huge role in how many patients you're going to see on any given day. Um, we do pay attention to something called the wet bulb globe temperature, which lets us monitor how high the humidity is getting. And if it's actually at a dangerous level, usually we will recommend canceling your event or making it non-competitive, which for a lot of these endurance events, are they're non-competitive by nature, but you obviously the time demands are going to put an excess strain on the patient. So mm-hmm. And a lot of times they end up canceling the endurance events in particular. Um, the hyponatremia issue is something you touched upon earlier. When that comes up, that has been something that's been looked at. And they've had some pretty interesting studies that have come out of primarily the Boston Marathon and Berlin Marathons. And so because it's great that people are getting out there, but the question is, are they actually hurting themselves by being out there uh, for these races? And the studies have shown that if you are training above... 40 miles per week for these events, you tend to, you have a statistically lower chance of developing hyponatremia and cardiac injury during the race as those who train under 30 miles per week. And you think, well, 30 and 40 isn't that different, but when you think about the, the prolonged training that goes into it, it really does add up over time. Um, they have, they're doing more studies now to see if there are other risk factors for hyponatremia during a race, so that's something to keep in mind when you are seeing these patients, because I think a lot of people assume that the patient is just dehydrated, but it, it could actually be hyponatremia. In our region, one of the big impacts has been, or referrals for patients, has been those tough mutters and extreme races. Oh, yes. <laughs> we actually had a, one die a few years ago mm-hmm. in one of those. A lot of times in our area, they tend to be when it's a little bit cooler, so we have a lot of hypo, uh, hypo, uh, hypothermia. hypothermia. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, hypothermia, um, as well as the fatigues, the ankle injuries, and that sort of right. thing. Uh, when it comes to those, how does an emergency department need to prepare when we are dealing with, if you know that's coming, you can't go at this blind because you will right. have a quite an orthopedic intense weekend Absolutely. if you're not ready. I think one of the most important things that an emergency department can do if you know one of those events is coming to your area is talk to the event organizers and see what kind of obstacles they have. They do have a standard set of obstacles that they can use at any given race, but they do put different ones on different sites. So hmm. it helps to know if you have a fire pit or a the electrical wires or whatnot, just to know what kind of injuries you can expect. Um, And then also to make sure you have the x-ray support you need. (coughs) A lot of docs are are doing that. They're trying to get involved themselves. A lot of those couch to 5Ks. Right. So let's get some advice. When you were talking about those folks getting (coughs) getting more active as we we want to see, we want our docs to appreciate wellness and to take care of themselves so they're there to take care of their patients. What, what, what's an, do you have advice for folks that are thinking about that have spent many years now, you know, especially if you've gone through med school, gone through residency, now you actually have somewhat of a potentially a def- decent <laughs> schedule, and um, you're like, well, I need to get back into shape. I've spent a lot right. of time on the couch, in the chair, and in, mm-hmm. you know, in, in bunk rooms in the hospital trying to <laughs> catch a few hours sleep. How do we get that transition to actually an active lifestyle? So I think the first thing is to be realistic and to know that if you're doing one of these programs, that your first goal should be, the first time you do one should be to finish. It shouldn't be to be the winner. Um, I think so. Being, it's hard for doctors. It, it we're used hard. to being, we're being, we're used to being competitive. We're absolutely. used to being the winner of the best. And you're, you're absolutely right. You think mm-hmm. you're going to stand up and immediately be, <coughs> be winning the race on the back end. Yeah. So I think going into it with realistic expectations definitely helps. And it sounds crazy, but make sure you have appropriate footwear. Um, to just protect yourself that way. Um, a lot of running specialty stores have now dev- uh, cropped up around the country. Um, and it's actually a great resource to go to instead of just going to the local sporting goods store and saying, oh, I, I like the way this shoe looks. Um, but the running specialty stores do have, are primarily staffed by runners. Um, they can watch your gait and put you into a shoe that's going to fit your biomechanical profile, which should theoretically help limit your orthopedic injuries down the line. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The... Um, Current guidelines from the American Heart Association say that if you're above 45, you should have a screening physical exam done by your physician before you start the program. And I know 
it's a touchy subject with physicians because we're horrible patients. Generally. We're all allergic to doctors. Oh, absolutely. I, myself included. But um, I think just, especially if you have any cardiac risk factors, it's definitely a good idea to get checked out before getting to that point. You mentioned shoes. And I know a lot of docs I see out there have <laughs> the same shoes that they've had for 10 years. I mean, yes. they got the old old Reeboks or whatever from, from 10 years ago, the toes are worn out. Mm -hmm. What's the importance of proper footwear? I mean, it's more than just the look. And there's Absolutely. There's a lot more to it. Yes. Um, so there are a couple of different things to look at at footwear. Um, the first one is the shock absorption. Um, and that does tend to go down after about six months uh, if you're not running regularly or the, the, between 300 and 500 miles is a recommended time to replace your shoes. Now, remember 300 to 500 miles doesn't mean for me, that would be about 15 years or so. Yeah, exactly. So uh, about yeah. six months, six months to a year. you got to get those shoes replaced. Make sure you're taking care of your feet right. uh, because that is a, a big issue for chronic-related stuff. Yes. Well, I really appreciate your time. Any, any other input and thoughts when it comes to uh, sports medicine and uh, emergency medicine? So I think the most important thing is that in the emergency department, we do see a ton of sports medicine. Um, so it's always good to keep the orthopedic perspective in mind. Um, but I think in general, emergency medicine and sports medicine go very well together because as we've talked about, there are a lot of conditions that do happen at games and races that the emergency physician is very well trained to take care of. What about participation? You know, mm -hmm. thinking about that, you mentioned games. Um, I go down, I do a lot of uh, work, work, do some work with NASCAR and we'll be good down in Talladega this uh, next weekend. Being involved, it seems emergency physicians are moving out of the department more and more to do athletic Absolutely. events like mm -hmm. working the Tough Mudders or the marathons or the races or NASCAR or football or wherever. How give us you know the opportunity there for physicians to get involved, and you know some of the things that they need to be better. How can they be better at being prepared for that sort of thing? Sure. So I think a lot of it goes back to the fact that as emergency physicians, we have pretty interesting backgrounds or. We have interesting hobbies outside of the hospital. And I think if you want to get involved in something, it's an easy way to start is in your background. Like I, I mentioned, I'm a runner. I do a lot of running medicine. Um, and that's very easy because I understand the mindset of the runner and mm -hmm. I've had half the injury, so I know what they're going through. So I think that helps. And then just reaching out to the community and seeing if there's any opportunity to get involved that way. Dig in, get those unique, uh, <laughs> make sure you understand the unique challenges or potentials that you're going to face. A football player's risk is very different than a yes. distance runner, which is very different from a sprinter and things like that. So understanding those unique risks mm -hmm. um, that are out there, getting seeking that extra education. I mean, I think the opportunity in sports medicine is actually very appealing to that emergency medicine yes. mindset. Yeah, and, and for those emergency physicians out there considering a fellowship and thinking, oh, I'm not sure if I want to actually do sports medicine, the information and the material you learn during fellowship is so applicable to everyday life in the emergency department. And when you're going through the fellowship, and especially your first couple of years out, you realize, oh, we see a lot of fractures. We see a lot of dislocations. Um, but then you also see a ton of concussions. And it might not be the football player, but the MVC or the elderly patient who fell. And it's really, it, they the two specialties really are mended together nicely. I, I didn't, and I failed to mention it earlier when we were talking about the female athletes. You know, we think about concussions with with mm -hmm. males in football, right? But the number the the above football in terms of sources of significant head injury are cheerleading and soccer yes. and lacrosse. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's a significant risk out there to our female athletes, and it needs to be a real consideration. Yeah, absolutely. And even things, especially talking about lacrosse, there are completely different sets of rules in terms of equipment for men versus women. And men wear helmets, and the girls don't, which is kind of interesting because it's the same the same ball right. you get not quite the same amount of force but you get a tremendous amount of force behind a lacrosse pass and it's it's kind of interesting to think that wow we're saying that our boys need this protection and our girls don't but they're playing equally hard so it, there is a definite discrepancy but definitely concussions are very very common in the female athlete make sure you got that in your mind when you get those patients in there um, i really appreciate your time how can people get in touch with you if they want more information whether by email or social media yeah, um, email is um, mora.davenport at ahn.org. All right, fantastic. And as for us, you can get us on the Facebook at the ASAP Frontline page as well as at Everyday Med on Twitter. You're always welcome to email me as well, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. Dr. Davenport, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline.